you know, we used to think of the dollar as uh, good as gold. The debasement of currency is a sign of dishonesty. It's ultimately a sign of the loss of character. Character really is what's behind a nation's rise or fall. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, April 18th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, April 18th, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. As always, if you're new to our channel or if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe, hit the bell to be notified of new updates, and give us a thumbs up if you like what we do. We truly do appreciate your support. A very special guest joins us today on SBTV, Dr. Lawrence Reed. Dr. Reed is a public policy economist and historian and the president emeritus of the Foundation for Economic Education. And prior to joining the FEE, he served for 21 years as president of the Mackinac Center for Public Policy in Michigan, where he remains its president emeritus. A prolific author and advocate for free markets and liberty, he has authored the books Was Jesus a Socialist? as well as Real Heroes, Incredible True Stories of Courage, Character, and Conviction, and Excuse Me, Professor, Challenging the Myths of Progressivism. And we're delighted to have Dr. Reed here as a first-time guest on SBTV. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Dr. Lawrence Reed. Dr. Reed, welcome to SBTV. How are you doing? Hey, terrific, Patrick. Thanks so much for having me. Dr. Reed, you, you wrote a lot about the parallels between the decline of the Roman Empire and what we see in the U.S. pretty much happening today. And it was insightful that you distilled the cause for the collapse of civilizations and even the Roman Republic to the lack of character, that the corruption of morals was at the heart of it. So I, I would just like to ask you, why did you choose character and why not something like big government or money printing or something like that? Well, things like big government and money printing certainly uh, concern me and they played a major role in the decline of uh, the Roman Republic and later the empire. And then of course, uh, they certainly do uh, play a major role in the troubles in our country here in America today. Uh, but I was looking for something a bit more fundamental, something that might be, in fact, behind big government and money printing and other problems, something that might explain those things. And it dawned on me some years ago that uh, a nation's character really determines uh, ultimately the direction that it goes. Uh, and I uh, firmly believe that there's a powerful connection between a nation's liberty and strong, good character. I don't know of any society, ancient Rome is certainly one of them, and I don't think America is going to be any exception. I don't know of any society that lost its character and kept its liberties. That's how uh, closely connected that they are. Every time somebody asks me, and I get this question a lot in audiences really all over the world, people ask me, uh, what, what do you think the most important problem is facing society? And they're expecting me to say things like big government or taxes or opioids or COVID or crime or things like that. And I say, look, those are big problems. But uh, the number one problem in every country and at all time or the number one uh, source of trouble uh, relates to character. It all comes from character. People who lose their character uh, go off on all kinds of crazy, unproductive tangents, like supporting big government, dependence upon the state, uh, printing money as if uh, honesty no longer means anything in terms of your money. So character really is what's behind a nation's rise or fall. And that's why I think it's important to focus on that as an explanation for a society's rise and later fall. You know, I, I think at uh, in the beginning when Rome first became a republic, I think they were allowed to have one term, just one term as uh, as the leader of Rome. Um, would that be a form of, let's say, character where today we have politicians who basically camp out and park and stay there forever? And it does seem that their character does seem to diminish being that they know they don't have to leave. Yes, I really believe that there's a direct connection there. 
uh, Romans, uh, when they established their republic around 508 BC, uh, they were fed up with one man rule and uh, they got rid of uh, the last of their seven kings and established a republic. And at the very top of it, the top position was no longer a king, it was called a consul. And they were so fearful of concentrated power, they didn't even have just one consul. They had two, and they told them the decisions of one can be vetoed by the decisions of the other. So you two have to get along. And furthermore, you can only serve one year. They knew, uh, the ancient Romans, that if you give somebody total power, uh, it's only a matter of time before even the best of people will be corrupted. And that'll come at the expense of the uh, uh, liberties and even the lives of the citizens they govern. So it was a reflection on character. Romans understood that uh, if you want to encourage bad character that has terrible results on other people, if you want to encourage bad character, well then concentrate power in the hands of one person and let them keep it as long as they want. They will be corrupt in no time at all. Uh, getting back to some of the, the similarities, do you, do you see this kind of an ideological transform that has been happening in the United States in, in a similar fashion. Yeah. Now, societies that are 2,000 years apart and half a world away, uh, of course, have many differences, but there are many similarities. Uh, the decline of character in ancient Rome during the Republic, I, I see a lot of parallels between that and the decline of character in America anyway, and much of Western Europe, maybe other places too. Uh, in recent decades. Uh, the first thing that begins to happen is people don't value truth the same way they previously did. In ancient Rome, uh, in the first few hundred years of the Republic, uh, people thought that the truth, being faithful to what you know to be true, uh, was a, a side of solid character. You don't prevaricate or lie about that. Truth is truth. You try to uh, discover it and uphold it and practice it. But in time, with the erosion of character, truth becomes sort of a convenience if it serves you, but an inconvenience if it doesn't. So you're quick to cast it aside if you think there's some temporary advantage you can get from that. Well, don't we see that all over the place today? Uh, in fact, in America, there's been a disturbing trend in recent years where people talk about not the truth so much as they talk about his truth and her truth. And I saw this during the uh, Supreme Court uh, nomination hearings for Justice Kavanaugh a few years ago, where people kept uh, talking to witnesses and referring to, uh, you know, tell us your truth. What is her truth? Oh, she told his truth today. And I kept thinking, wait a minute, there's no such thing as his truth or her truth. It's either the truth or it isn't. And the same thing uh, you saw in the declining days of ancient Rome. I mean, that, that kind of leads me to, to ask, where do you think or at what point in time did we lose the value of, of, of truth? Well, it started uh, late in the 19th century, and it started then in academia for the most part. Philosophers and professors, and some of them uh, heavily from Germany, as a matter of fact. A lot of the so-called German school was later imported into the United States. It's a way of thinking that regards truth as sort of uh, relative. Truth is what you want it to be. Uh, there is no absolute or, uh, truth. It's sort of like uh, what's true for you, you know, is what works for you and may not be true for somebody else. And that kind of uh, moral relativism really gathered steam in the 20th century to where today it's commonly uh, taught foundationally uh, across many disciplines in much of academia. And, you know, a society that no longer is committed to truth, but rather to mere convenience or what you think is good for you at the moment, whether it's good for others or not, is a society that's on the path uh, to destruction. I mean, we can just go back to the 2020 election, Dr. Reed, and we saw a nation divided the world, so a nation divided and support for left-leaning socialists Policies seem to be increasing, while on the other hand, we have seen pushback against globalism. We've seen pushback against liberal progressivism. Do you, do you think that uh, today's divide is a result of a lack of understanding about America's founding father's vision for constitutional freedom and true concepts of liberty, wealth creation, and genuine economic productivity? 
That's a major factor, uh, Patrick, in uh, the troubles that we're seeing. Uh, I don't think that uh, Americans are learning as they once did uh, about the important and very positive values that made the country possible in the first place in many parts of academia these days, not just at the university level, but at K-12 as well. There's a deliberate trashing of America. Uh, and, you, you know, you can't have whole generations being taught that their country is evil, that, it, you know, it has to be completely transformed and overhauled and the, the past is evil and our ancestors were evil. And so if, if you think that, if you think there's, there's nothing good about a, what is essentially a truly good country, but not perfect, then uh, I don't see how you can shape a positive, uh, prosperous and free future. And the left knows that. That's why they have very deliberately gone about to undermine our understanding of our own country here in America. They, they want Americans to think that, no, you're terrible, the country's terrible, and everything needs to be uprooted and thrown away. And, and by the way, put us in charge so we can fix that. Uh, it's a power grab, uh, but a very clever one by people who know that uh, you have to undermine people's values and ideas if you're to be successful at uh, gaining control over their lives. I guess that brings me to, to another question where how did we let our colleges and universities, how did they evolve into more of a, a liberal type of university more than, let's say, a conservative type of university? Yeah. You know, if somebody had told me 100 years ago uh, or somebody had asked me, let's say, how can we take American academia and turn it against the country itself? If I had to come up with ways to do that, I would say, well, the way to do that is to uh, uh, increasingly take the control of education away from parents and give it to uh, bureaucrats in state and local, uh, state and uh, federal governments. Um, and then uh, throw federal aid on education because with aid we know will come federal control and bureaucracy. And from the top, we can control a lot of things that we could never get control of if we had to do it school by school. Uh, so, uh, and that's essentially what the left has done. Uh, but I have to say, uh, parents, uh, we should not think of them as innocent bystanders in this. Uh, many parents have swallowed the line that ed the education of their kids is no longer their responsibility. And so they don't even know or care what their kids are learning. Uh, and they just send them off and pay the way and pay their taxes and let uh, professional government subsidized academia and bureaucracy teach their kids. But I can tell you, uh, Patrick, from history and experience and logic as well, that government has never been a good teacher of either liberty or character. So when a society says to the government, you take charge of our kids, you teach them, we have other things we want to do, uh, you're in for trouble. Uh, there's just no two ways about it. And speaking of, of government, what do you make of the ease at which the U.S. government is extending trillions in stimulus checks at such a rapid pace, all in the name of helping people and helping the economy and money? But it's really money that the country just doesn't have. Yeah. You know, it's, this is another sign of the decline of character and the decline of high expectations and standards that we once had for people we send uh, to political office. There was a time in the not too distant past when many Americans would be horrified at this crazy spending spree and they would have enough uh, discipline, self-discipline and understanding of basic economics that they'd be crying out, hey, we can't do this. It's not sustainable. We don't have the money. You're just going into debt, which means you're sending uh, the bill to generations yet in the future. That means my grandkids. Uh, I don't want them to be so burdened by debt because of our current consumption that, uh, that, that, that they'll drown in it. Uh, but today, you know, so many people think, oh, well, you know, it's, uh, it'll help me in the short run. Or what can I do? Or, hey, if it causes problems for our grandkids, well, we'll be gone. Let them worry about it. Um, you know, those are the kinds of attitudes that uh, are never healthy, that never lead to a good outcome. And yet uh, we have adopted them, whether we realize it or not. And these handing out of uh, stimulus checks, is it a form of socialism? Some call it relief, but some are actually saying, you know, we, we are at a place where socialism is beginning to have a strong foothold. Yes. When you concentrate power, when you concentrate money, 
when you empower the government to rob Peter to pay Paul, to dispense literally trillions of dollars of money it either doesn't have or can't get except through taxes or borrowing or printing paper, uh, you're well down the path uh, to socialism. You're concentrating economic and political power in the hands of the state. And uh, that is always historically the most uh, dangerous thing you can do for individual liberty, the concentration of power. Socialism uh, is, is really a tool of control over the lives and thoughts of other people. It's the concentration of power in the hands of the state. It may be for all kinds of ostensibly good reasons. You know, they always sell it as, well, we're helping people. We're, we're getting them through a pandemic. We're taking care of their business for them so it doesn't go broke. And we're doing all kinds of wonderful things with it. But if the bottom line is that in the long run, you're enslaving people, both to political dictates and to debt, uh, you're not doing them any favor. Rome was perhaps one of the first civilizations to have a form of a welfare safety net with their, uh, their grain dole system. How does that grain dole system compare today with the U.S.'s stimulus checks going out? Well, the idea behind it is somewhat similar. Uh, in the middle part of the second century BC, uh, around the 140s uh, before Christ, uh, this would be with only 100 years to go before the Republic would end. Uh, and uh, you have then the imperial dictatorship we call the empire. Uh, so in, in the 140s BC, you had uh, public officials deciding, hey, government shouldn't be just to protect the lives and the property and the rights of people, we should use, a, use it as an apparatus to redistribute. We should buy votes with it. Uh, and so they started offering uh, grain subsidies, first subsidized grain, later in many cases, free grain. And to that, they later added free salt and pork and olive oil and other staples of the Roman diet. So the people became dependent upon the state. Uh, less and less was your livelihood dependent upon what you did. It was more dependent upon what the politicians decided to do for you at other people's expense. The welfare state is sort of like a big circle with everybody uh, standing in a circle. Each person has his hands in the next guy's pockets. It's really not free. Uh, uh, and the politicians, of course, are raking off a, a nice cut for themselves. The problem with every welfare state is it, it, it can't, uh, it either has to be re reversed and ended or it continues to grow because different people say, wait a minute, why should I be the, just paying for all of this and not get any of it? And more and more people say, hey, give me some. I'm special too. And they come up with all kinds of reasons why they should be subsidized. And before you know it, taxes are through the roof. They have to uh, uh, cheat on their money uh, like we do by printing more of it, uh, reducing its value in order to pay the bills. And then we all collapse in fiscal uh, irresponsibility, uh, leading then to political dictatorship. Uh, so in that sense, we're on the same path today. Uh, now, our dole doesn't take the form of grain, but it's still uh, goodies from the government, subsidies for COVID relief. You know, if, from the same government that ordered you to shut your business, now they throw some money at you and say, see what good guys we are. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's uh, frightfully expensive, it's, it's demagogic. Politicians will use it to buy votes, to silence you ultimately, and to concentrate power in their own hands. That's what Rome did, and we know they didn't recover from it. I hope we will recover from it, but we are doing the very same thing. Yeah, I was gonna ask you about that, where the, uh, the grain dole system, I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I would think in the beginning or, or short term, you know, maybe this was a good thing for, for people, but I, I'd have to imagine long term, as you were saying, all of these things didn't really work out well. And you had mentioned where uh, the U.S. may be headed towards a, a dictatorship. Um, what phases along the way, if we get to a dictatorship, do, do you see coming that may be similar to what happened in Rome? Oh, that's a great question. This has really focused my attention recently because I see such frightening parallels. In those latter decades of the Roman Republic, you began to see politicians with the support even of uh, people in the public sort of cast their constitution aside. Uh, Rome had a constitution like the British. It was an unwritten one, but it had very powerful 
uh, rules of consensus and of uh, custom and precedent. Uh, things like, uh, you know, the two guys at the top can only serve one year. Well, in the latter decades of the Republic, you had uh, those officials increasingly saying, well, I know that I'm only supposed to be here a year, but you folks really need me. So let me make an exception and, uh, and I'll stick around for another year. And there was one such consul named Marius who ended up serving uh, seven uh, one-year terms. I mean, he just couldn't let go of power. And, you know, when the dam breaks like that, then everybody starts saying, oh, well, the heck with the Constitution. Let's just do what keeps us in power. And we're doing the same thing today. And you see it, uh, presidents by the stroke of the pen, by executive order, exercise massive power without the consent of Congress. That's exactly what happened in the latter days of Rome. A few hundred years before, people would have been uh, outraged by it. And they, and they would have prevented it from happening. They would have thrown out of office anybody who so abused their power. But after a while, they were bought and paid for by the Roman welfare state. So they remained silent to get the goodies as the corrupt politicians continued to gather power around themselves. I've often heard the phrase where the, the Constitution is for the people and executive orders or for government, where the Constitution tells you what government cannot do and executive orders tells you what government can do. Um, do you do you see that the same way? Oh, absolutely. Uh, executive orders uh, are so broad and expansive these days. I mean, uh, think of the one that uh, President Biden issued that uh, stopped the Keystone Pipeline. Now, whether you like the pipeline or not, uh, it should frighten you that one man can just sign a piece of paper that throws 11,000 people out of work and cancels to a deal that's been in the work for years. I mean, why should one person have that kind of power? That should frighten everybody. And yet there'll be a lot of people who will say, oh, but that doesn't directly affect me. I don't work on the pipeline or I'm not interested in that. What they fail to understand is uh, unbridled power doesn't stop at a pipeline. Uh, it's after you and it's coming for you sooner or later. That's a great point. Uh, you know, according to the Mises Economic School, the denarius, which was used during the time of Jesus and the, the Roman Empire, was approximately one-tenth of a troy ounce at that time, about 3.9 grams of silver and roughly worth a day's wage for the common laborer. And the denarius was a remarkably stable currency and Roman emperors did not begin debasing it with any vigor until Nero. Yes. Throughout, your, throughout your research, Dr. Reed, how does currency debasement factor into the decline of empires and are they a sign of the, the end game, a final desperate attempt to salvage a crumbling empire? I think the uh, debauchery of the currency debasement uh, is, a, is a powerful indicator of where a society is heading. As, if all I knew about a civilization was that their leading authorities were systematically uh, cheapening the currency, I would say without knowing anything else, they are probably a society in decline. Now, maybe it doesn't show itself fully just yet. They may even be still militaristically uh, expanding, but internally they're eating themselves alive because the debasement of currency is a sign of dishonesty. Uh, think of it this way, a sound currency, and this is the way it was considered in, for much of American history, a sound currency was a testimony to the soundness of uh, the monetary system. And you know, we used to think of the dollar as uh, good as gold. And uh, you, you, just, you just don't debase it because it's our currency. And when you reduce its value through the multiplication of it, you destroy savings. People have less and less incentive to save because the why save in something that's worth less and less from year to year? Uh, it has a lot of harmful economic implications, but uh, it, it's ultimately a sign of the loss of character. People who tolerate that in their leaders are basically saying, we don't care about sound and honest money anymore. Uh, if our politicians want to debase it and be so dishonest to do that, well, we get some short-term benefits from it, so we're not going to raise a fuss. Well, they're a civilization by definition in decline, morally and financially. Getting back to the founding fathers, weren't they pro-gold, pro-silver, anti-central bank? Uh, many of them were, 
Now, there were some exceptions, you know, Alexander Hamilton, our first yeah. uh, Treasury Secretary under George Washington, he was an advocate for a central bank and was the key figure behind the establishment of one uh, in 1792. Uh, and so he was one of those founders who did favor uh, the concentration of more uh, power in Washington, you know, but by today's standards, he, he still is practically a libertarian. I mean, he, he would be shocked uh, to see the size and the scope of government today. But then you had the Jeffersonians who were more committed than Hamilton was to um, strictly limiting government and they didn't want a central bank. Uh, and of course they would prevail when the first bank of the United States was not renewed after 20 years in uh, 1812. Um, now, there was an effort to create a second one, and it was created in 1816. But then uh, uh, when its 20-year life was up, uh, uh, President Andrew Jackson killed it. And we had no central bank from 1836, uh, really, until the Federal Reserve in 1913. Uh, and that was an era, except for the Civil War, of powerful economic expansion in America without a central bank. So our founders were not perfect. Uh, most were not economists, but they understood that uh, the number one thing they had to do was to keep uh, power from being unchecked, to uh, limit government to protection of life and property, and basically say to it, do that and otherwise leave people alone. This is kind of similar today where I think uh, most, most people in Congress, they aren't economists either, which is maybe why we're, we're so much in, in debt. But uh, you mentioned in your in your writing that uh, with the failure of character and values, uh, these are usually followed by a transfer of authority and wealth and authority are often very much intertwined. Can you share with us what you meant by transfer of authority and how much of this transfer is influenced by new found wealth from productive companies that will take the place of unproductive, let's say, zombie companies that are going to be finally allowed to fail? Uh, what I meant by that, uh, Patrick, was, for instance, uh, when institutions of society, family, uh, church, school, so forth, when those things are governed and managed, uh, started and, and run locally, then liberties tend to be more intact because if somebody tries to pull a fast one, chances are you might know that person. They might be your neighbor. And, uh, you know, you're, you're, it's easier for you to blow the whistle when uh, liberties are uh, attacked uh, at a very local level. But when you start uh, conferring authority upon more distant powers, whether it be uh, the state or uh, the federal government, then it's harder for the citizen to object when his liberties are taken away, because I mean, you got to jump on a plane and go to Washington and testify and, and hope that they'll listen to you. And, you know, it's a lot harder to do that. So most people don't bother to try than it is when the uh, tyranny develops on a very local basis. So that's why our founders believe very strongly, uh, almost to a person, that uh, keep things local as much as possible. Don't concentrate power far from the people because it will be abused uh, inevitably. And, uh, and yet look what's happened, say, in education. Education used to be very personal and very private. And even when governments got involved, they were only local governments. Uh, and you knew the teachers, you knew the school board uh, because they were your neighbors. But now what happens in the schools often is dictated by some curricula created by somebody you never met, don't even know, uh, 2,000 miles away. Uh, that's the transfer of authority over your child uh, and his or her education to distant authorities. That's what we've done with education. We're doing it with uh, almost every aspect of life by empowering um, uh, the federal government. Uh, you had a second part to that question, and I forgot what it was. How much of this transfer is also influenced by newfound wealth from productive oh, companies? Yes. Well, certainly, you know, a, a rapacious government that's always looking for revenue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they have their eyes out all the time for somebody who's creating wealth because to them, that's something that they can get in a position hopefully to take at some point. And if you've noticed, uh, the tactic of those who want government to take more is often to first vilify somebody. And then once you vilify them, make them, make them into villains, then you can get the general public to support 
your efforts to go take what they've got. And so we vilify the rich, we vilify the entrepreneur. Uh, you know, uh, there are good ones and bad ones. And the kind of entrepreneur who runs to the government to get special favors, I'm opposed to that too. But the great majority of entrepreneurs are hardworking, honest people trying to create wealth. They've got great ideas, they innovate, they take risks, uh, they employ people. They often fail, but keep trying. I mean, they exhibit the kind of traits that any vibrant, thriving, free society should want to see more of. But uh, people who gravitate to government see those kinds of people as competing sources of influence and power, and they want to take their stuff. And uh, that, that never ends well. Yeah, it's, a, it's another great point. Uh, going back to when you were talking about teachers and, and, and our parents knew our teachers and, you know, they probably lived in the community it kind of reminds me of also your, your neighborhood bank. I mean, people knew who that, that banker was. Uh, he knew yeah. you. He, he knew uh, he could vouch for your loans and things like that. And we've lost that. Uh, do you think this is also maybe a part of what has happened with the banking system, why, why it's gotten so large and why uh, it's taken on, let's say, so much risk? Because we just don't know the people anymore. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's a factor. And I recall back in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, which was, by the way, brought on by uh, lousy government policies, um, dirt cheap interest rates from the Federal Reserve for almost a decade, at the same time that laws of Congress and rules from the bureaucracy were jawboning banks to make loans to people who could never pay them back. We started down that path, and then we had a financial bubble and crisis as a result. And then Congress passed laws ostensibly to fix the banking system. But uh, those laws had the effect of crushing many local community banks across the country uh, and concentrating power in the hands of smaller numbers of big banks. That's a, that's a direct result of government policy. And it's so hard for somebody today to start a bank. You know, it used to be that your neighbor could do that. Uh, and, but it, now, you know, you've got to have so much... Uh, regulatory approval, you got to be politically well connected, you got to have the approval of the already existing big banks to get very far. We've made that whole business so rigid by uh, the involvement of government that uh, it's become distant to us. And uh, people just often don't know um, uh, bankers, local bankers like they used to, because even they are like puppets on a string, and the marionettes are in Washington or in some big bank somewhere. Okay. Uh, Dr. Reed, uh, you mentioned that if, if you could meet one person in all of uh, human history besides Jesus Christ, you chose Cicero, the Roman statesman and historian. Why Cicero? Yeah, I am fascinated by Cicero. And if you were here right now at my house, Patrick, you would see in the next room, as people come in the front door, there's a large bust of Cicero sitting on a pedestal uh, because I so admire him. He was uh, uh, the last great and articulate defender of the old Roman Republic. As it was crumbling around him, as he saw the Roman welfare state corrupting people, as he saw uh, men striving for power to rule over others, uh, he just saw that uh, this is not the Rome that uh, he wanted to pass on to the next generation. This was a violation of all the rules that made Rome great in the first place. And, and uh, he didn't just sit by and complain about it. He tried to stop it. Uh, he became one of Rome's two uh, consuls for a year uh, and uh, in 63 BC. And he did a magnificent job. And, you know, even some of his previous predecessors had tried to accumulate more power and hang on longer. But Cicero did his job for one year. And as he was supposed to do, he retired. And then later, when political leaders try to aggrandize power uh, to themselves, he came out of retirement and spoke out against them. He spoke out against Mark Antony, uh, Julius Caesar's successor, and uh, gave a series of 14 speeches before the Senate, uh, in which he ripped Mark Antony for being a dictator in waiting, uh, empowering himself at the expense of Roman liberties. And for that, Mark Antony dispatched an assassin and had him murdered. Uh, and I think if you had to put a date on when did the Roman Republic end, 
and the period of dictatorship we call the empire begin. It was with the death of Cicero uh, in 43 BC. Uh, he was the last of the most courageous defenders of the old values of, of liberty and constitutional um, uh, procedures. Okay, so just to be clear for all of us that uh, fell asleep during history class, his name is Cicero. Yes. Okay, I think I pronounced his name uh, wrong before that. Um, okay. Dr. Reed, um, you know, if, if you look at Rome and, and the timeline between when it was first established as a republic and, and how you just said when it ended, and when you look at the U.S. when it first started, and um, if there if there is an end, let's say, where on that timeline would we would we be on a scale of one to ten? Uh, would we be at five, six, seven, somewhere around there? With uh, ten being the end of the republic, yes, would ten say, being the, the yes, the end. Yeah, I, well, I think we're in the uh, comparably speaking in the latter days, so maybe uh, you know, like about an eight or nine. Oh. Uh, so the hour is late. It's not to say we can't learn from our mistakes, learn from Roman history, and turn things around, but it is late. Uh, Washington is spending like mad. It's printing money like crazy. The, in the near term, we're likely to see a lot more price inflation. Um, I, I just see so many of the things you saw in ancient Rome uh, within a few decades of Rome's uh, demise as a republic. So hope it doesn't happen here. I'm not giving up. But it is uh, it, the hour is late. Okay, you know, Doctor Reed, since I since I steered us once again towards the road of doom, I, I need your help here. Yeah. I'd like to end on a note of hope for a change for for our audience. Where do you find hope in times like this? Well, let's remember that uh, human beings are creatures of ideas. We're not robots uh, that are pre-programmed by uh, anybody. I mean, I, and I'm a Christian, so I, I'm the first to say God gave us free will. Uh, yeah. And we have the power to use the brains that he gave us to learn from mistakes and change from bad policies and bad ideas to good policies and good ideas. So I remain an optimist that uh, ideas can change. And looking back on the great moments of history when that's happened, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, uh, usually they come about quickly and without much notice. Remember the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989, uh, just months before it happened, there weren't many people predicting it. And yet later we look back and say, wow, how did that happen? Beneath the surface, there were forces taking place that uh, not everybody saw. And then they all came together with the right combination of personalities and of ideas and of events to cause uh, climactic uh, uh, changes. So uh, I'm hoping for that in the good sense in the not too distant future. I don't know what might prompt that, but uh, I just keep telling people never give up hope. Pessimism is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, you've got to continue to uh, work for what you know to be right. That's what good people of solid character do. Don't let the other side ever win anything uh, without, a, without a fight. So I, I remain optimistic that someday, not too distant future, we will turn things around and we'll look back and probably say, wow, that was a close call. We almost lost everything, but uh, we came to our senses and I'm working toward that day. Amen. Dr. Reed, before we wrap up, can you let our listeners know more about your work and where they can find you? Yes. Uh, I have a website, uh, and it's lawrencewreed.com, and that's spelled L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E-W, Reed, R-E-E-D, lawrencewreed.com. No, no punctuation in the first part before the dot .com. Uh, there you'll find uh, just about everything I write, uh, books and articles, uh, free stuff. <laughs> I, I say that in quotes because, you know, there's no such, such thing as a free lunch, but um, you can read my stuff there at no charge. Um, and also the organization that I uh, have uh, continued in connection with, FEE, F-E-E dot org, is a great outfit uh, for teaching basic economics and history and, uh, and freedom and free markets, FEE dot org and lawrencewreed.com. Right, Dr. Lawrence Reed, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, and I hope we can do this again sometime soon. Anytime. Thank you, Patrick. 
That was Dr. Lawrence W. Reed, President Emeritus of the Foundation for Economic Education. For more of his information and his work and his views on the economy, please visit the FEE website, www.fee.org, and search for his articles there. He can be reached via email at lreed at fee.org. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SPTV channel to be updated on new content. You can also check out the SPTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify.